I added a few more slides, so hopefully I'm under the hour. Hopefully. Okay, perfect. We are live now. Hi, guys. My name is Sharita Marie, and we are here live with Pre-Dental Universe, and we're going to have a live session with our amazing dentist, Dr. Jennifer. Dr. Jennifer, take it away. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, just wanna quickly introduce myself. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Sylvan, pediatric dentist uh, in Fort Lauderdale, well in the Fort Lauderdale area, practicing in Pembroke Pines. And today I kinda wanna do something a little bit different um, in terms of just engaging you all and being able to encourage you on your journey uh, from here until you graduate dental school or residency. So. Topic is basically seek out what is meant for you. You can kind of see this picture that's on the title page of me in between this arch uh, that is in Utah, and I'll kind of tie all of that in. So, sorry, next slide. <laughs> so, a little about me. I know you guys read a bit of info um, in regards to just a snippet on Instagram. So. Born and raised in Florida, um, have three brothers. Yes, I'm the only girl. No, I was never spoiled. <laughs> I was basically a tomboy growing up. So I didn't have room to kind of just be girly and enjoy certain things. Like I played sports, I played basketball, football. Uh, I ran track, did so many things just to stay active, um, as well as trying to maintain academics throughout high school. So I attended the University of Florida, um, graduated in 08. I also attended grad school, got my master's in public health, graduated in 2010. So I kind of want you guys to keep in mind the dates that you do see. Um, attended Howard University, College of Dentistry, graduated 2017, and then completed residency in Tampa, Florida in 2019. So that was associated with NYU Langone Hospitals, formerly known as NYU Medical or Lutheran Medical. Uh, we have 13 different sites, including one in Alaska and two in Hawaii. And so I think they're working on Puerto Rico um, as of now, but we're not quite sure just yet, just because of everything that's just been going on. And so I do enjoy traveling. Uh, I love the beach. I'm always there every weekend. That's the perk of being here in Fort Lauderdale area in South Florida. I love majority of things outdoors. So you can kind of see myself down on the bottom screen, parasailing with my brother. He didn't have a good time, but I had a blast. That's probably as far as I would ever get to being as high up. Probably won't do the bungee jumping and uh, not so much skydiving. So <laughs> I kind of like to stay tethered to the ground as best as possible. Um, so for me, I've always been very health conscious. So I've been vegan for the past three years. Um, I don't push it on anybody. I just know it's better for me overall. I'm a proud dog mom of my little chihuahua, Jackson. That's him pictured down there. Yes, he is that small. Is he always that happy? No, but that's okay. <laughs> as long as he's fed, he gets his walk and I leave him alone, he's all good. So he is a rescue. I got him in residency. That was kind of one of the things that I needed to kind of help balance just the stress that came with residency as well. Just needing something to take care of as well as something that was just constant for me, that unconditional love when I was kind of stressed out. So. And then, like I said before, I am currently practicing in Florida, specifically Pembroke Pines, which is a very nice area, well developing. And so within the area itself, there is a high need uh, in regards for a pediatric dentist. So pause a little bit about me. So I kind of want you guys to kind of go on a little journey with me. No, you don't have to close your eyes. No, we're not gonna chant or do any mantras, but I just kind of want you guys to kind of go along with me because I am a storyteller. So I, I do have a lot of visuals. So I kind of want you guys to just hear me out in regards to this part. <laughs> so here is the arch that I was telling you guys about on the title slide. So this is located in Moab, Utah. Beautiful scenery, just amazing. You would think nothing much of it. Um, it's a very popular trail that a lot of people go on when they're in the Arches National Park. There are multiple different arches, but this is the one that is popular. 
And so it doesn't look like much, like I said, but everybody goes and they take pictures here and they're like super excited. So imagine this being your end goal. Imagine this being you wanting to get into dental school. Imagine this being you wanting to finish dental school (laughs) and then also going into the residency of your choice. It's beautiful. It's your goal. It's what you want to attain. Everybody, the person next to you, behind you, wants to get to this goal. But what if I told you that the journey looks like this, that it's dry, it's humid, there is zero to little shade whatsoever. The little shade that you can possibly get is maybe two trees that everybody's gathered around. And of course, we have to keep in mind social distancing. So you just have to keep trekking. Before you even start, the park ranger tells you, you need to make sure you have two liters of water. Not everybody makes it. It's about 100 degrees outside. Are you still going to go on this journey to get to this destination that you want to get to? You would think that 3.2 miles from start to finish back down to the beginning of the trail would be nothing. You can run that like on a weekend, not a problem. But when the elevation is high, close to 4,000 feet, are you still going to do it? When you have to go up a steep a hill, are you still going to do it? When your shoes are sliding down, even though you have hiking boots on, are you still going to make it to your end goal? You're sweating. You feel like you're about to die. Like everything is melting. Your friends fall behind. You're trying to encourage them. You have people who are coming back down from the top of the hill telling you, you can do it. And you're just like, yeah, right. But by the time you get halfway, you look back and you see this. You realize how far you got. Do you want to stop there or do you want to keep going? You have the same people again coming back down and saying, you're almost there. You can do it. You can kind of feel it. You sense it in your bones like I'm almost there. Why should I stop now? No matter how difficult the road is, there's a rock that's about to, you know, tumble down from the side of a hill. You got a kid that's like maybe a couple of weeks old that's like crying and the parents are taking them on this hike. You have the oldest person who I met was about 80 with their walking sticks just going at it. So no complaints whatsoever. And so you're looking like, why am I struggling? Like, what is going on? Because I'm focusing on everybody else's journey. I have to focus on my own. I know that I want to get to the top of this hill. So I'm going to do it at my pace. I'm going to do it the best that I could possibly do. Push myself however I can, but not worry about the person next to me. Encourage people along the way, of course, but I have to make sure that I make this journey my own. So my stats, my journey, unpredictable, definitely didn't expect it to go this way, but it is what it is. I'm here now and I'm very grateful for the path that I've taken to get to the point of being a pediatric dentist, the best pediatric dentist in my area. At least that's in my professional opinion. So so for me, I decided I always wanted to be a doctor of some sort. That's just the label that my family put on me from the very beginning. And that's just what I went with. I always excelled in sciences in some way, shape or form. So now, but for me, dentistry, I felt like I had to convince my parents. I had to write a full dissertation just to let them know like, hey, I wanna be a dentist. They're like, dentist, what is that? My patients, my my parents, excuse me, are patients. So island parents, it's either you are a doctor, lawyer, nurse, maybe engineer, somewhere in that. So to tell them that you wanna be a dentist is just like, okay. So as long as I told my parents I was gonna get a white coat at the end, they were happy. It is what it is. So for me, I decided to become a dentist when I volunteered at a rural clinic Uh, called Acorn, and that was a few miles out of Gainesville, Florida. And just what I saw there in terms of just the instant gratification with with patients walking in and then walking out happy, like it was just something completely different that I've never seen before. It seemed like a little bit more of a positive environment, and I just love the patient interaction. And so I made that decision the summer after my freshman year. 
And so come the fall, I'm taking biochemistry, I'm taking organic chemistry, a lot of other like heavy science courses within that fall semester. And then all of a sudden around September, October, I got really sick. Don't know exactly what was wrong with me, had a sore throat, my joints were swelling, I couldn't walk, couldn't take care of myself. My family had to drive up from Fort Lauderdale to Gainesville to take care of me. And so with that, I just felt devastated. I had to medically withdraw from the semester. I felt like I was just behind. My science GPA just took a major hit. This is coming from the girl that was always perfect in every way um, and trying to make sure that her academics were always on point. So mentally, emotionally, physically, I just went through a lot within that semester and just felt like I was always trying to play catch up with everybody else around me. Hence why I said, make sure that you focus on your own journey and not compare your journey to everybody else because that can also deter you as well. Even if your route, your journey is unorthodox, non-traditional compared to everybody else, still make sure that you are focused on your journey. So I also had an academic advisor tell me that I would never get into dental school. I would never become a dentist whatsoever with the straightest face. And I just sat at his desk and cried the whole entire time. I went um, home that weekend down to Fort Lauderdale. I'm just rethinking my life. I'm like, mom, should I like just not go back to college? Should I like, you know, transfer somewhere else? Like, should I even become a dentist and even try? Like, he's like, you know what? This is what you want to do. This is the passion that you have. You have to go about it in a way that is best suited for you. If whatever higher power you believe in, if this is what you feel as if your calling is, your passion is, don't let anybody or what anybody says deter you from seeking after that. And so even still, um, after all, like, you know, science GPA improved over time, but it's, it wasn't as great as it should have been. Despite my stats, I still applied to dental school. And of course, the result was I didn't get any interviews. I said, okay, fine. Let me figure out a whole other thing to do. Let me figure out an alternative. Like, what else do I like? I do love people. I love hearing their stories. Like, I want to make sure that uh, their needs are met in some kind of way. So I thought about public health, just so I can tie in a little bit of the disparities that I kind of learned in undergrad in regards to access to dental care, uh, what it meant for, you know, a certain population to not be able to have that access. So I went ahead and I got my public health, master's in public health. And so also within that program, I took a few science courses. So that also helped to boost my GPA as well. In that time frame, I worked as a dental assistant at the University of Florida in the pediatrics department, where I basically met all of my lifelong mentors majority of like my colleagues who either graduated with me from residency or from dental school and just like our stories just kind of mixed it so to me i imagine like had i finished when i wanted to i don't think my journey would have been as impactful i don't think i would have been able to make the friends in the dynamic that i have with them now and just it's just just beautiful how everything worked out so i applied again to dental school got a few interviews but then i was waitlisted i was like ah oh, what is going on like i really want this like like i don't want to give up so i need to figure something else out so i completely took my mind off the of dentistry altogether except for when i was working at a private practice setting so i'm like i need to find other things that i do enjoy so I volunteered a lot, made friends in other areas um, in terms of like their professions, um, figured out things that I liked as a person, um, traveled for a little bit. And then that actually gave me more talking points during my interview. Like I was seemed to be more of a well-rounded person as opposed to somebody that was just solely focused on academics. So then I applied to dental school yet again. <laughs> I did cast my net out a little bit wider. Um, I got more interviews that time around and then was accepted at Howard University College of Dentistry. Now, I did get acceptances at other places, at other schools. But at Howard, I felt like that was more of 
it gave me more of a home, like a family feeling. Um, I actually felt like I belonged there. I felt like they were invested in me as a person. Not to say other programs don't invest in you, but that's just a feeling that I personally got. And so I went ahead and I said, yes, I do accept your offer. So yeah, the rest was history from there. And so back to our journey here. So imagine you finally get to the top, you attain the thing that you've always wanted. All the people that were on the journey with you are now celebrating with you at the top of your journey. And this is what you see. Everybody is just so excited. All of a sudden, that hike that you made to get all the way to the top doesn't seem as hard. It didn't seem as hard. You're not complaining about it anymore. Everybody is just excited at the fact that they even made it to the top. That's basically how you're going to feel once you get accepted into dental school. And then everybody is on the same playing field. There's no comparison. Your first year, you're not even thinking about anybody else. You're thinking about the fact that, oh my gosh, I actually made it here. Once you get your foot into the door and you are accepted into dental school, I promise you, you are going to make it. You're going to make it, okay? So I know you guys have been told before, academics and things like that don't matter. Um, it does matter, but I don't want you guys to to overdo it and stress yourselves out too much. If there are alternatives and, and different routes that you have to go in order to be a competitive applicant, by all means, take that. Don't take it as, as if it's a failure. Think of it as a way for you to become more resilient, a better way for you to be an, an applicant that actually shows that they have the determination and the fortitude to overcome obstacles. So regardless of if you're that person that stopped under that, that tiny little tree to take some shade for 20 minutes, or you're the person that kind of plowed through and just went up to the top of that hill without stopping, you all get to the same destination. So, all right. So wild journey, but an incredible journey. Like with my tribe, my family behind me, and then also with my co-residents and my attendings, I definitely made it through dental school. And I made it through residency. As much as I may have struggled in undergrad academically, I excelled in dental school. Um, just because I think your mindset ends up becoming a little bit different. It's no longer a desire to strive to get to this goal. It's more of just like, I really want to finish so that I can help people and make a difference. So that ends up being your drive. Same thing in residency as well. Your class size gets smaller. I came from a class size of about 80, 85 in dental school to now a class size of just, <laughs> just the four of us. So <laughs> you have to make sure that you're keeping your network really tight and you have to make sure that this is something you definitely want to do because no matter the level that you're at, the difficulties are all different but there are difficulties, you know? So there are things to overcome. So in dental school, you're studying and you're doing all kinds of crazy things just to make sure that you're staying awake to study. You're in the cadaver lab sleeping um, next to a dead body, unfortunately, just to make sure that you're able to identify every part on your cadaver or you're just staying up on campus and studying until the test the next morning or you're in residency and you're on call and you get a call at 3 a.m. knowing that you have to show up at clinic at 7, 7.30 in the morning and still see patients that day. So there are difficulties no matter what stage that you're in, but just know, enjoy the journey and that is going to be incredible. So once I finished residency um, and being close to my family in Florida, I was just determining that, hey, you know what? I have to go back down south because I've been missing so much. My cousins have gotten married, people have had babies that I don't even recognize. So I'm like, okay, I need to go down to Fort Lauderdale. So from there, I decided to come back home in practice and leave beautiful Tampa to come to Fort Lauderdale. And so now currently, like I said, I work in an office in Timber Pines. We have an open bay. Uh, we do have one uh, particular room that is designated for restorative work. Have an amazing staff. Um, just 
everything there just worked like clockwork for me personally i love the interactions that i have with the parents with the kids and it's just amazing so i work in a clinical setting but then i also have the opportunity to work in the hospital as well and so there of course i'm kind of taking you on a little journey from the parking lot trying to get down there to then you're seeing the operating room and then kind of like the back area of where I scrub in. And so it's always a fun day in the OR for me, little jig there. Uh, it's always fun in the OR for me just because uh, the parents are just so grateful and you're able to just kind of change the lives of your patients like within a day, you know? So I'm gonna go into that just a little bit. With the operating room, it does look intimidating, to be honest, but just remember when you get to this point, you are the doctor. Just know that. You know your patient from head to toe. So it's definitely your responsibility, but the fact that you know your patient from head to toe, it kind of alleviates a little bit of the pressure because you're doing what's best for your patient that you know. It's not just a random stranger that's on the operating table. So. This is a patient that you cared about. This is the patient in which your family, like you have gained rapport with that family. So they know you as a provider and they're trusting you to make sure that their son or daughter is all done. Like in terms of just um, all treatment is done and they're, they've been rehabilitated in terms of their dental work. So, so typical day, sorry. <laughs> in the clinic, so like I said, I work in two different settings. So in the clinic, start time would be 7.30 a.m. Average number of patients would be about 50 to 60. Yes, in peds, those are real numbers, uh, just so you know, <laughs> because it all depends on where you are and where you practice, where the need may be high. If you're working in a private pay like office, then of course numbers will be a little bit different, but if it's in a public health setting, numbers are gonna be a little bit higher. So average number of assistants that you may have would be four to five. Uh, range of procedures are limited due to just the time of the appointment. So you can't do full mouth rehabilitation if you wanted to just because you only have 45 minutes um, with each patient when it comes to restorative. When it comes to just your cleaning appointments, then it's roughly about 30 minutes. And so by the time Everything is said and done, you end your day, maybe 4.30, 5 o'clock, depending on how many notes you have. Level of satisfaction for me personally is a 10. When it comes to the operating room, your start time determines is determined by the hospital when they decide that you are gonna start because there may be cases before you. You may have ENT that's in the room right before you and their procedure may take a little bit longer. Or you may have you know, uh, some type of, um, cardiac case that's right before you as well. So it, it all determines, it's all based on what the hospital determines in terms of when you start. The average number of patients that day usually is about four to five or four, excuse me, three to four. And then from there, uh, assistant wise, you could be in there by yourself, or you could also have two assistants that kind of help you in terms of passing the materials that you need and assuring that everything is present and accounted for before you start your cases. Now, the range of the procedures, there really is no limit because you're, you're scheduled for that operating room for three hours max. Uh, so you basically are there to do everything that that patient could possibly need dental-wise. So from crowns to extractions to fillings, basic cleanings, because sometimes you would have patients who are special needs who need to only be seen uh, in the hospital because behavior-wise, they just won't be able to cooperate as well. So those particular cases may take a short amount of time, maybe an hour. So that's where you can end up fitting in that fourth case for the day. And so as far as in time goes, it all depends on when you start. <laughs> so if your start time is at noon, you may end up leaving the hospital sometime after 5 p.m. So it all depends on when exactly you start that day. Still for me, level of satisfaction is a 10. Just because I'm able to just give the parents that reassurance that everything has been taken care of, 
their child no longer has to be you know afraid that every time they go into the dentist that they're going to have work done so from now on for this type of patient they're just going to come to the office and have their cleaning so it's always more of a positive experience for them now definitely take questions at the end for sure and so why pediatric dentistry i got tired of hearing this statement <laughs> while I was in dental school or even when I was an assistant um, at University of Florida like I hear a lot of the parents say I hate the dentist but I have to make sure you know my son or daughter is okay and I heard it throughout dental school as well in particular clinics when we rotated just like I hate the dentist I hate the dentist so at some point I kind of asked people like so why do you hate them like whoa oh, when I was a kid something happened and from there I just I haven't been to a dentist in like 30 years and I'm like what that is like that's crazy so in my mind logically it's better to start at an earlier age and give a positive experience so that way once in the future you're not running into all of these problems to where you're going to the dentist only when you have pain or only to the point where it's extreme to where you have to do some type of invasive procedure as opposed to it just being preventative. The other thing is I kind of get to dress how I want. Um, <laughs> bright colored like scrubs. I wear a lot of headbands. Uh, I can talk in a Mickey Mouse voice if I want to, or I can get very serious like this when I talk to the parents. Um, also, I'm very small. I'm only five foot flat. Um, so I'm less intimidating to a lot of my patients. And so I also love the educational aspect as well, where I can kind of tell them what the importance is of brushing and flossing and educate them as to why it is that they need to come to the dentist without that uh, bias or that fear that's already underlying. So, oh, and then the other excuse is I get to watch cartoons too. Um, just so I can be well informed. <laughs> so, all right. So let's go into a few case studies. I only have two. So we'll start with patient BS. And so I kind of keep them as initials just for the sake of patient autonomy. And then you'll also see kind of where I, I take out, um, I kind of blind over like their eyes. So, so with patient BS, uh, she's a leader, three-day-old patient. She came in with mom, and the chief complaint was we were sent here by her doctor to check how we can fix her tongue tie. Breastfeeding has been painful. She, she just keeps biting me. And so her medical history is non-contributory, so you always want to take a general appraisal of the patient, take all of their history, dental history as well, even though they're only a few days old or a few weeks old, whichever it may be, you always want to make sure that you take a full account of their history. Medications, no, and then also no allergies. And so a little bit more about the patient's history. Of course, she's never been to the dentist, but like mom said, she was referred by her pediatric or pediatrician. And then ASA, so that basically means what level of health that she's at. So there's about four to five levels within that. So one being the healthiest, and then of course with five being closer to dead, if not dead. Um, so social history wise, uh, she's one of three children. His parents did have one set of twins. However, one, pa one twin died. Um, at 10 weeks due to infection. And so the extra oral examination revealed that everything was within normal limits. So she didn't have any facial swelling or any lymph nodes that were swollen. And then of course the intraoral examination revealed that her tongue was doing this cupping effect and that also her lingual frenum was attached to the midline of her tongue. And so this is basically what it looks like um, in terms of what I was describing. So we took some preoperative photos and you can kind of see in that very top picture where the frenum is attached. It is like right on the underbelly of the tongue and it's anchoring down on the base of where her gum tissue, where the ridge of her gums are. And so it was very hard for her to actually stick her tongue all the way out without doing that heart shape effect that you can see on that second picture. 
So mom attempted to feed her right before she came into the appointment. That's basically the white coating that you see on her tongue. And so she's like, yeah, she's still having a hard time right before we got here. And she's very gassy. And so I just kind of stopped feeding her. And I kind of wanted you guys to see um, exactly what we can do. And so before we dive into what was actually done on this patient, we kind of want to do a full assessment as to what the classification of the tongue tie is. And of course, the scientific term for a tongue tie is ankyloglossia. And so there was a particular system that was developed in 1999 by Dr. Cutlow, revised in 2011, that kind of gave you classifications as to where exactly the tongue tie or the frenum was attached. So if it's about zero to three millimeters from the tip of the tongue, then that would be a class one, four to six would be two, seven to nine would be a three, and then 10 to 12 would be a four. So that's more so where the frenum is kind of disappearing into the base of the tongue and still not allowing for the tongue to actually protrude out to where it can fully. All right, so based on the descriptions, our patient is a cut low class two. So the frame attachment is at the base, the midline of the base of the tongue. All right, so basically ankyloglossia, like we said, is a scientific term. So definition of development of developmental anomaly of the tongue characterized by a short, thick lingual frenum resulting in the limitation of the tongue movement. So you can have partial ankyloglossia as well, um, or by the tongue appearing fused to the floor of the mouth, which is total ankyloglossia. So the prevalence of that is between four to 10.7% of the population. Um, in my experience, I've seen it maybe in six different cases um, from the time I was in residency until um, now in private practice. So um, a lot of them have been resolved. So people are seeing it more and more earlier and catching it. So either by the uh, primary care physician, ENT, speech pathologist, or the dentist. Um, we're trying to catch these a little bit earlier, even before they start school. So certain things that you may run into when it comes to the point of concern as to why you wanna address this, according to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, so the AAPD, uh, breastfeeding is usually one of the difficulties. So in this particular case, that was mom's issue. You also have limited tongue mobility, so that's very important, especially with cleansing the teeth. So let's say if your patient has just finished eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, we all know it gets stuck in different places and different crevices. So if you're not able to do something like this with your tongue, it leaves a lot of plaque buildup. And then that's where you end up seeing a lot of cavities closer to the gum line because the tongue is not able to help cleanse that area. I know you guys are doing it now, it's okay. Um, the other thing is uh, speech difficulties. So this particular patient is Hispanic. So one of the important sounds in Spanish is rolling the R. So if you're not able to do that because you have limited tongue mobility, that is a point of concern, especially culturally speaking. You also have issues to where the patient can be uh, within a class three malocclusion. So basically meaning that the patient can develop an underbite just because of movement of the jaw and trying to force a particular motion because the tongue is not able to adapt the way that it's supposed to. And then you also end up having gingival recession. So when the patient starts to develop teeth where that frenum is attached on the base of where the gum ridge is, it starts to pull away over time and it can also cause separation in between the lower teeth as well. So from this diagram, you can kind of see where the normal tongue position is. So you can kind of see how it is underneath mom's nipple. And so that way the patient can be able to kind of do a full suction motion as opposed to a patient that has ankyloglossia, the tongue is not able to position itself well and then you're using, the patient is using their mouth or their teeth to kind of get optimal, optimal milk supply.
So symptoms that can occur. For the mom, you have cracked, blistered, or bleeding nipples. The other thing would be plug ducts. Uh, discomfort while nursing, you end up having mastitis as well, where there can be an infection within the breast, and it is very, very painful. Um, you're sleep deprived because, of course, your child is or eating well, and so you're trying to figure out what is going on. You're wondering if something is wrong with you. Um, you also then end up having a compromised milk supply. In terms for the child, the infant, you end up having reflux or colic, uh, difficulty latching, gumming, or chewing on the nipples, or they end up being gassy. Like I said, for our patient, BS, she ended up just being extra gassy because she's like gasping for air at the same time she's trying to feed. Uh, you end up having poor weight gain, a uh, clicking sound when they are feeding, which is not normal. People think it's cute, but it's not normal. Um, and then also you have excessive drooling and then also choking on milk or popping um, off the breast because they're trying to gasp for air. All right, so the importance of breastfeeding, I won't read the full like diagram, but basically that it does have an effect on um, obesity as well. So it can lower the risk of obesity and type one and type two diabetes. It also reduces uh, the risk for ear infections. And then also it helps with the development of teeth as well in terms of providing the proper nutrients that a child needs to develop their teeth. And so you always wanna keep that in mind. Um, a lot of the times you hear that breast is best versus the bottle, but if a parent chooses you know, bottle feeding, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as a child is also getting the proper nutrients that they need. Okay, so for our little cute patient, BS. So um, at the initial consultation, we always prepare the parent and let them know things that we need them to bring um, at the actual procedure appointment. So she, we had a follow up with her seven days later. So at this point, she's 10 days old. And so we asked mom and dad to bring, you know, baby's favorite blanket. Also make sure that we're bringing a bottle if mom still chooses not to breastfeed. Um, and just making sure like maybe her favorite music, little things like that, that can kind of help to comfort her throughout the procedure. So there are one or two ways in which you can approach uh, being able to relieve the tongue tie. So you can do it with an actual blade itself, or you can do it with a laser. For our particular patient, BS, we went ahead and moved forward with a laser for neck and neck. So with a laser for neck, for me, of course, you have all the supplies that you need. So armamentarium is just a long word to say the supplies that you need, okay? <laughs> That's basically what that is. So you kind of see where that Solea uh, laser is or Serona laser, that one in particular. And then also you would have something called the groove director. So that second from that, and then you have the tip for the laser then you have your syringe that is gonna hold your normal saline solution. You have your gauze ready, uh, suction, as well as the topical cream that you're gonna use to numb the area. In those black boxes that you see at the top are the special glasses that you would need just because of the, the kind of intensity of the laser, you wanna make sure that you are protecting your retina. All right, so in this particular case, because of the patient's age, you don't want to use traditional numbing methods um, in terms of using a syringe to numb the patient, so like lidocaine or septicaine, just because you run into complications, particularly meth hemoglobin anemia. So basically that means that when you inject the solution, it may have an effect on the oxygen carrying rate within the hemoglobin. So you don't want that to decrease, especially at their young age. So we went ahead and we just used the topical cream that has uh, just topical lidocaine that doesn't have to go into their system and pralocaine as well. So I'm gonna show you kind of where you want to administer that. So with the groove director, kind of looks like Mickey Mouse. So I really love that. 
Um, and then you kind of are able to retract the patient's tongue. And then right where you see that orange, like little circle, that's where we went ahead and administered the topical cream on both sides of the frontum. So we kept it there for about a minute or so before we moved forward with the laser. And so with the groove director, like I said, you're able to pull the tongue back. You have your normal saline solution on deck just to make sure you are irrigating the area very well. So making sure it is uh, hydrated and making sure that you're kind of cleansing away any of the tissue that is sloshing off, as well as having your suction ready and then kind of doing very like light strokes with the laser. You don't have to dig in too deep with it. Um, it's cutting like even at the lightest touch. So we chose the laser because it was a cleaner cut and you can cauterize the area a little bit better as opposed to using a blade because then it will have a tendency to bleed and then we're having to uh, perform like hemostasis with a gauze or a cocktail of some sort. And then also it's less painful and then baby is actually able to feed like right away. And so post-operatively, this is what the area looks like. It's more of like a pinkish red. Over time, it is going to become like a white grayish color. So you always want to advise the parents to look out for that. Like there's nothing wrong. The area is just healing. And it's kind of like this little diamond shape that's at the base of the tongue. Um, so you also want to kind of make sure that they're well equipped as to what to do post-operatively. So we also give them particular exercises that they need to do and then we'll review a video. So she was able to feed right away, right after the procedure. And so mom was super happy about that. She's like, oh my gosh, she doesn't even seem like she's like fighting so much to like even eat. Like it's getting a little bit easier for her. So we saw her again a whole week later and mom said that finally she was able to like breastfeed. At this particular point of the procedure, she wasn't able to just because she was still a little bit sore. And so with the exercises, let me see if I can get this today. No. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So this one is not playing. It almost did it. Here it is. Okay, so this is for the upper. And so what we need for this patient are tongue stretches. You have to make sure that you do those stretches to ensure that the frenum attachment doesn't uh, relapse or so that way it doesn't attach again, okay? So it's very important that the parents know to do that. So with our second case presentation, slightly a bit more sensitive topic-wise um, just because of what it entails, but I still want you guys to understand that Yes, you may have cute babies that come to your office and that everything is great and everything is positive and it's like, oh, this just has been just the perfect day. Other times you have cases to where your heart is just broken to where you're thinking like, I can't believe that this is happening to a child this age or a child at all. So with patient SH, I kind of want you guys to focus more so on the picture, the image of the patient. So with patient SH, um, she is seven years old. Now, if you think of a seven-year-old, would you ever think that they are this small or this tiny? And I do have another image to where you can kind of see um, how tall she is in her full stature. So this pa particular patient presented to Tampa General Hospital via Child Protective Services. So in her particular case, um, 
her teachers did notice that she is very small and that she just looked very undernourished. Um, and then also the school nurse did note that she had a lot of dental decay going on. So at that point, Child Protective Services were involved in the case. And so the medical history arrives for this patient. And she's also wearing this cap and just keep in mind with that cap, okay? So medical history, so mild persistent asthma, according to the father, there is an asterisk there just because dad was completely unsure of the patient's medical history. Um, as far as medications go, uncertain, um, could not recall the last time she had an asthma attack, cannot recall any of the medications that she took or if she even has them. And then according to the father, she doesn't have any allergies. So we would kind of put this patient as ASA three, just because she has a condition that is not under control. So patient history, um, problems list involved, persistent, mild persistent asthma without complication, severe protein calorie malnutrition. So the patient only weighed 34 pounds. Uh, she was diagnosed as being failure to thrive. She had dental decay, dental abscess, and head lice infestation, which is why she was wearing the hospital cap. She also has a uh, transaminitis, which is basically an overload of the enzymes within the bloodstream, just because her body is trying to find some type of nourishment and just breaking down on itself. And then also with the chief complaint, basically of how she was reported was because of child neglect. So history wise, based on stories from mom and dad, patient was with mom for a little while, um, along with five other siblings and cousins. And then all of a sudden for two months, she was with dad with two of the other five siblings, uh, paternal grandparents. And then dad basically said that he tried his best in making sure that everything, you know, the patient got everything that they needed. And that mom was saying that, oh no, he promised that he would take her to the dentist. So it was a lot of like blame shifting. And so of course, as a provider, you don't really get too involved in that particular aspect of things, um, but you are focused more so on making sure that the patient is back to 100% health dental wise. All right, so with the extra oral examination, no significant findings, no swelling, despite the abscesses that we saw and the amount of decay that you will see. Uh, no signs of her lymph node swelling whatsoever. TMJ was still within normal limits. And then her mouth, the range of motion was still within normal limits. Intraoral examination. So chronic clinical abscess on teeth E and G. I need you guys to always know what those teeth are um, as far as primary and permanent. Uh, generalized gingivitis, uh, multiple broken down and carious teeth, root tips um, that were remaining in her mouth at the age of seven, D, E, F, and G, which should not really be there anymore. Um, also with K and T, which she's supposed to keep until she's 12 years of age. Generalized uh, decay noted on the remaining of her teeth, and then the permanent first molars are present, which are supposed to be present at her age. And she also has number nine erupting apically and facially from tooth number F. And then we'll go over a chart so that way you guys have an idea of where those are. So eruption sequence. I starred this because you guys should always know this. No matter what specialty you're going to go into, you have to know this chart. So that way you can kind of educate parents, educate the patient themselves as to what's going on with their teeth. If you look at a panoramic and you see that something is missing, the patient is 12 years old, but they don't have a particular premolar, you can kind of educate them and let them know about that. So with primary teeth, age seven, she should have the front teeth on the upper and the lower shed it already. So those should have already exfoliated to where the adult front teeth, top and bottom, should then be growing if not already fully out. 
So with this panoramic view, everything looks very bunched up. That's because this patient has crowding issues as well as the decay on top of everything else that's going on. So you can kind of see, um, if you look at the center of the image, more so at the top row of the teeth, you can kind of see where tooth number 10 is at an angle. So it does have a, what we call an ectopic eruption pattern. So there's also some pathology associated with the crown of that tooth. And so this particular patient is a mixed dentition, basically meaning that she has the baby teeth and the adult teeth simultaneously in her mouth. And so this is a standing picture of patient SH. And you can kind of see even with the hospital gown itself, it's not fully on her. The nurse that you see in the picture is kind of holding her top of her scrubs or her hospital gown a little further back so that way we can get like a full view of her silhouette. And so clinically, you can kind of see what we had to work with in her mouth. So now with the first patient that we had, that was in a clinical setting. Now in this particular patient that we have, this is a hospital setting. So this is the general anesthesia case. And so when she was under, we were able to take the clinical photos um, and fully get uh, an appraisal of what was going on with her dental. So clinical photos, you see the upper on the left hand side of the screen. And you can kind of see where she has the adult teeth in the very far back. You have your 12 year old, uh, excuse me, you have your second primary <laughs> molars, and then you have your first primary molars in the canine. And then, of course, you have the root tips left of the anterior primary teeth, as well as one permanent tooth trying to erupt in whatever space that it can get. And then now, so also on the lower, you have the permanent teeth that are in the back, so the six-year-old molars, and then you have your second primary molars, and then whatever left of the second primary molars. And then you have your first primary molars, canines, um, and then so forth with the anterior teeth. Now you also wanna kind of take an appraisal of the amount of space that she has or lack thereof. So that way you can then notify other specialists, particularly the orthodontist to figure out what can be done as an intervention. And so you also wanna take a side profile shots as well, just because if you do plan on taking crowns, you wanna make sure that the patient is fully able to occlude. So you take a preoperative photo just to make sure that they can close down all the way. So that way, once everything is done postoperatively, you can kind of take the same images as well. And so we're able to take radiographs of her um, and you can kind of see just how badly decayed some of her teeth are. There are some instances of where we can save so if you look at the picture that's on the right hand side with that second primary molar, you can kind of see how big the decay is on that too. But because she was already gonna lose so many, we wanted to save as much as possible. So for that particular two, we ended up doing a pulpectomy. So that's basically a baby root canal to where we kind of go in and clean everything out, place medicaments in there, and then at that point, place a crown on top. And so other teeth as the ones that you can kind of see on the left hand side, the third to last tooth, that particular one, which is tooth B, we ended up extracting that one, taking it out, but just because there was just, just no room. When you look at the picture from before, I'll show you this one that's on the left hand side, on the right side of the mouth, you can kind of see where that tooth has been eaten out like an apple core. So once it's like that, the teeth that are adjacent will end up moving into those spaces where the decay is. So that's called space loss. And at that point, you can't really fix it without damaging the adjacent teeth. Okay. Then we have lower images to where you see the root tips left over of teeth that we just, we just can't save at that point. Um, so you always want to make sure that you're taking the appropriate amount of x-rays um, and making sure it's at the right angle. So just in case you are extracting teeth, you at least know where the permanent teeth are positioned 
whether or not that patient is missing those permanent teeth or they do have them, you still want to make sure you take the images and let the parents know what it is that you saw uh, within those x-rays. And so this is the particular proposed treatment plan. So of course, everything is red is what we're going to do, um, what we plan to do. And so we have three sealants to protect the adult teeth in the back. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten extractions. We have four crowns, one of which is going to be a pulpectomy, and then we have one filling on an adult tooth. And so this is post-operatively of what you see. And so, of course, you see a lot of the extraction sites. You see where we place the crowns on the upper and lower. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at the x-rays post-operatively. So side view as well. Um, so like I said, you want to make sure that the patient is fully able to occlude. So that way the crowns aren't sitting too high. And so when she's, you know, home, she can actually be able to eat. And so here are the post-operative radiographs. So you can see on tooth number J is where we did that propectomy. So with the pulpectomy, you're feeding the medicament from a syringe and you have to do a pullback effect. Sometimes it can get stuck in where you can end up having voids, but as long as it's fully covered, you're okay um, to be able to go ahead and move forward and pack what you need as far as IRM, MTA, uh, Vitrobon, and then go ahead. I know these are like crazy terms, but Vitrobon and then go ahead and put the crowns on. And you'll learn all of this when you guys enter into dental school. So trust me. Um, so then the extraction sites post-operatively and then on the right picture, you can kind of see just a little bit of where we did the crown on the lower. And then if you look on that back tooth on the right picture, you can see where that white center is and that's where we did the filling. All right, the upper and lower pictures. And again, tooth number 10, which is right in the center on the right-hand side, kind of angled on the side. That's that tooth that we said had ectopic eruption or impaction. And then also with this right picture, you can see down on the, on the bottom where the adult teeth are trying to come in, but don't even have the space to even orient themselves. And then this is the full completed chart to where we went ahead and moved forward to where what I told you all. Um, so one filling, four crowns, three sealants, multiple extraction. And so with this patient, I want to go back to something. Um, when we saw her for the initial encounter, and I think one of the nurses told her that she had head lice and that we had to get rid of them, and she cried because she said, they're my friend. And so that like, I had to walk out of the room at that point because I like, I just, I just couldn't handle it at that time. Like everything else that you can tell me, like medically, scientifically, I can handle that. But that particular time, like the human emotion just got to me and I'm like, I have to do what's best for this patient. And so at the end of everything, um, she had a one week follow up. And of course, with CPS being as quick as they are, they got her into medical foster care. And so they have a big book on everything that she, you know, has gone through medically, you know, her previous doctor's visits and everything and just making sure they're accounting and, and bringing her to all the specialists that she needs to go to. And so within that house, there are also other children. And so she said, you know what? I didn't need the lice anymore. Like now I have real friends. And so like that just, whew, once again, like just uh, got to me and just tugged at my heart. So um, whew, thank you guys for letting me share those two cases. And so with that, I go back to my initial statement of seek out what is meant for you, no matter the journey. Chances are you might just change someone else's life. Had I let the obstacles that I faced in my journey to get to this point, I wouldn't have been able to make the changes or the life-changing um, procedures or go about them for these two particular patients. So as well as the other patients that I've seen 
from the very first patient that I ever saw in residency at the top left in the red shirt to the very last one down on the bottom left who still invites me to her birthdays and makes sure that she, you know, tells me that she's brushing twice a day now and letting me know, like, she's about to start school and just, ah, to (laughs) just the people that have been on my team, whether I was in the hospital doing OR rotations down on the bottom center, um, where I've been able to do over a 100 hospital cases and change the lives of a lot of our patients, to teaching abroad in Jamaica, to also winning awards in dental school and residency. After my academic advisor told me I was never gonna be a dentist, he's not even here for me to even prove that point, but still, like, I proved it to myself to know, like, you know what, I can actually get to fulfill this dream that I've always wanted and I'm doing it right now to where even at the top center of having my first year in practice interrupted by COVID just unpredictably and not going the way that I wanted it to now being able to say I also got through that as well. So all the obstacles that you can possibly think of, definitely you may end up encountering it or know somebody that will encounter it. So make sure you're encouraging yourself and other people along the way as well. Thank you. Any questions? (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer, for this um, presentation, really inspiring journey and teaches everyone to not give up. And um, to ask you a question about that, what kept you going after several years of applying? And if you would look or compare your journey with others, well, some people like apply during their junior year and get accepted mm-hmm. right after they graduate. On the side, you had to apply several years, wait this duration, and I'm sure you've had moments where you were unmotivated. So Mm -hmm. what was your motivation? What kept you going? And how did you keep yourself sane during all these years? (laughs) So I come from a family of just long life caregivers. Like my mom is a nurse. My father is a pastor, my grandfather was a pastor, and just having like that underlying compassion that has always been there kind of fueled me throughout the years to know like one day I'm going to change someone's life. Whether it's through dentistry, whether it's along the the journey for dentistry, I'm going to end up changing somebody's life. Like I felt as if like dentistry was made for me in a sense because I love the artistic aspect of things. I love the combination of science. And I felt like as if, if you can say that a career is your soulmate, dentistry was definitely a soulmate for me. Um, So I allowed my love for it and the people that I know that were rooting for me to continue to push me along the way. Any other questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Jennifer. So I know you talked a little bit about your um, experience at Howard, but could you tell a little bit more about um, how it was at Howard? Okay. So at Howard, of course, there's a lot of like cultural diversity. So you definitely meet people from different walks of life, whether they're from the continent of Africa, like specifically like from Nigeria or from Sierra Leone, or you have somebody who's from Jamaica, or you have somebody that's from Iran, or somebody that's from Palestine, whatever it may be, everybody has their own walk of life and their own story. And the amount of perseverance that you hear from your colleagues, from your classmates, like that alone made me feel like, like I belong. Because these are people who are willing to share their stories with me regardless of the fact that I may be competing with them one day for residency spot, or I might be, you know, competing with them for like an award in school, whatever it may be. Um, There was always a sense of community, a dynamic to also help each other along the way. There was no me before anybody else kind of mindset. There was always all of us collectively together. All 80 plus of us are always or we're always trying to help each other, even till this day. We're all trying to make sure that current students are able to have some type of um, network system or mentorship 
where now a list of us who are pediatric dentists are opening up, you know, our schedules for people who need mentors just because of just everything that's going on. There's always just been a sense of community service, a sense of mentorship that was always taught to us at Howard. Clinically speaking, you're definitely going to be uh, proficient clinically once you leave Howard. We've had professors that have been there since nearly the inception of some of our clinics within the program um, who have gone through Howard themselves and kind of know like everything that there is to know about dentistry, whether it's dental materials, whether it's oral surgery, pediatric dentistry. You have so many people who are from diverse backgrounds that are just seeking those things out that you're trying to get at the level of where you're trying to get. And so I felt like I was inspired on a daily basis to know like somebody who may look like me has now achieved the thing that I want and it is possible. Or somebody that looks like one of my best friends in my class has achieved this thing that she wants to get to. So it was always a daily inspiration just to be at Howard and just knowing that you had faculty and staff that were behind you who still reach out to me to this day and just asking me how I'm doing as opposed to leaving it at graduation and never hearing from them again. So long-winded answer, but I would say family <laughs> is the feeling that I got, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer, for answering You're your welcome. question. Another question we have is, what advice do you have for undergrad students who have a low GPA wanting to apply for dental school at a HBCU, and that stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities? Mm -hmm. So I would definitely say take advantage of grad school programs if you can. Uh, one in particular would be um, USF. Uh, they have a medical sciences program where you can get a master's there. And it's basically outlined for you as far as all of the graduate level classes that you would need to boost your GPA. Um, if you wanna do another type of route, like what I did with public health, which then allows you to do a little bit more research and you can actually focus your uh, research on the dental area as well and specialty that can help you network as well as far as finding a um, principal investigator or being within or out in the community and kind of surveying certain things depending on what your research topic is. And that'll kind of broaden and open some doors for you because with me personally, I was able to, with the research I was able to do, um, I got in touch with a lot of people that were in the world of peace. Um, within the NPH program, I was able to get involved with people that were in public services type of positions to where you know they were able to write letters of recommendation for me and it was kind of different from the science aspect of things but if with you wanting to increase or boost your science gpa i would definitely say try to do a graduate level science uh, course so that way you'll be able to increase it that way thank you dr jennifer Welcome. so another question i have is where do you see your career in about 10 years? Oh man, okay. That's always hard because I feel like it's like ever changing. Um, so for me, I thought initially I was gonna work like every single day of the week and now it's more of like, uh, I think I'll just do four days because <laughs> it is kind of a lot physically when it comes to peds because you're performing for your patients, you know? So you're always having to make sure you're on point. And so for me, I definitely see myself in academia just because I do like to teach a lot. So like I said, I do teach abroad in Jamaica. I've done it for the past three years minus the year before um, just because of everything going on with the pandemic. And I just fell in love. Like I love to encourage people. I love sharing my knowledge. I love being able to um, find different ways to get people to think and to go about how to meet their goals. So long story short, 10 years academia, <laughs> for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Another question is, um, 
Um, so, um, what made you? What What made you um, not get accepted the first few times in dental school? What do you think mm -hmm. was the factor that prevented you so that others can um, be aware of? of it and what increased your chances okay so for me I felt like it may have been two different things of course statistically it was my science GPA um, that was just a reality that I had to face um, just because I wanted something so much doesn't mean I didn't need to put the work or the effort into it um, which is not, you know, my story. I put the effort into it, but just a lot of other things happened along the way. So I kind of had to put my best foot forward and kind of humble myself and realize that, hey, I needed to do a grad school program. And so science GPA would be one. The other thing would be, you know how when you're in the middle of an interview or you're in the middle of a conversation with someone, you feel as if you're well prepared. But when the nerves get to you, everything just doesn't come out the way that you want it to. So I would say preparing uh, for interviews, like optimally the best way that you possibly can, make sure that you're doing that as well. Um, so that way when they ask you questions non-dental related that are more so about you as a person, you don't fumble on those things because everybody tends to practice those typical questions of just like oh so tell me what happened in this area or this semester on your transcript or tell me why you want to be a dentist or what volunteer experience have you had in in dental offices so you know how to answer those questions but if they ask you a blanket question of like so tell me about you and then you're just sitting there like i uh, uh, i don't i don't know so it's you have to make yourself not just well-rounded, but you have to know yourself as well. You have to be able to sell who you are as a person and let that particular program know that I'm going to excel as a, as a student. I'm gonna make sure that you're proud of me by the end of the day when I graduate and say, yeah, that's my student. You know, like they made sure that they came in with their a good head on their shoulders. They represent what our school is about things like that. So you always want to make sure you do your research on that school and also make sure that you match with that program as well. So GPA, know yourself, know your school or the program that you're trying to get into. And how about the DAT? So with the DAT, um, I took that twice. So the only areas that were low for me um, the first go around were, it's been so long ago, guys. Uh, I think it was orgo and then the math portion. Um, so with that first round, I went ahead and I sought out somebody that I know was super successful um, in taking their DAT and I got a tutor. And so I would definitely say, once again, humble yourself, ask for help. So if you need someone to tutor you um, in regards to the DAT, like get the tutor, like please do. I mean, my highest like area was the PAT. Um, and then of course it was, um, gosh, what's the other part guys? This has been so long ago. <laughs> yes. um, bio yeah. was pretty high as well. Um, so. Just make sure you seek out your resources and get the help that you need. Um, also, at the time, I'm, I don't know if you guys still have it, but like Crack the DAT, um, there were like Chad videos at the time that were just circulating. Like I made sure to like dive into that world and get all the help that I possibly could to where my DAT scores the second time around was competitive. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jennifer. That was an absolutely fabulous session. And I learned so, so much through the cases. Yay, thanks. <laughs> so guys, um, the quiz will be posted right after we end this session today. And thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time.